What did I just do? <coughs> kind of a dumb question, eh? <laughs> so what's in the towel? Why? Why isn't there Pepsi or Dr. Pepper or apple juice on the towel? Because that's not what's in the glass. Remember that you just said that. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, welcome back to the Love Ran Red series where we have been exploring the actual words of Jesus in the order that he spoke them. And today we're extracting words from John chapter 7, Matthew 15, and Mark chapter 7. And up to last Sunday, Jesus had been very, very popular amongst the masses. Uh, he was being followed by crowds who were anticipating that he would feed them and do all sorts of miraculous things for him. But then he introduced himself as, I am. Make no <coughs> mistake about it, when you front end, or front end load a statement like, I am the bread of life with I am, <coughs> all first century ears understood that he was making himself to be God. For that's how God revealed himself to Moses um, just before the Exodus. And so, with those words and Jesus' explanation of what it meant to be, I am the bread of life, it provoked the, the, the multitude to desert him. They went, okay, you've crossed the line, we're no longer with you in going forward. Um, of course, the twelve and a few others stayed with them. They said, where else are we going to go? You're the one that has the words of life. And so they stuck around him. But from this point going forward, the resistance against Jesus is going to be profound. It's been easy going up until now. But now the opposition starts. John chapter 7 verse 1. Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. Okay, so that's opposition, wouldn't you say? Somebody wants to kill you? Leading the opposition was a religious group called the Pharisees. Now the thing about the Pharisees is they were God-believers. Yes, they were. But somewhere along the way, they had turned the faith away from a relationship with God to a list of rules and regulations about how to maintain holiness. That they, they took the relationship, they turned it inside out, and they made it religion. They were sincere, but they were sincerely misguided. And in their passion to maintain the rules and the regulations, they became Jesus' greatest opponent because he wasn't going to walk their walk. Imagine that. A person or a group of people in their pursuit of God, their actions are actually opposing God. Do you think that happens today? Wow. Remember the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz? He lost his heart. Then he's caught in a rainstorm and he's beginning to rust on the spot until um, Dorothy comes all the way from Kansas to rescue him and begin the journey to Oz. So that's the story. Well, the Pharisees had a heart problem too. Spiritually, they were corrosive. And while Jesus wanted to rescue them, they were intent on destroying him because he didn't do things their way. So by looking at this passage tonight, the words of Jesus in the order of, that he spoke them, we have to deal with what's presented. And we learn here the telltale signs of a faith gone wrong. I like to talk about a faith gone right. I don't like to talk about the negativity, but through the negativity we receive a positive message, as you'll see. 
Fault finding. Let's start with fault finding. Hmm. Know any fault finders? <coughs> I'm not talking about electricians there. <laughs> different kind of fault finding. Mark 7, verse 1 to 2. Then they came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. They found fault. Fault finding, as a characteristic trait, is an indicator that your heart is not in sync with God. See, the Pharisees' rules included that before you eat, you wash your hands, but not only do you wash your hands, you have to scrub them with your fists. This was the regulation. They saw Jesus and his disciples not doing that, and they went, ah -ha! Jesus, you disrespect and ignore the rules. You're a bad person. Now we've got you. What is it with people that go make it their business going around catching people doing the wrong thing? I've been in churches for a few years. I've met the occasional person that does that. Do you know there's a, there's a company that's called Teardown.com? Teardown.com. It's true, Mickey. You can't make this stuff up. Their business is to find a product that's released, let's say an iPhone 6. They want to be among those first in line to buy the product, and they'll buy a few of them. They take it back to their shop, and they tear it apart. They assess all the parts, and they put a value on the parts, and onto a spreadsheet, they give it to an attorney who looks for patent infringement so that they can sue the manufacturer. They actually buy new things to tear it apart so they can sue the manufacturer. There are people in this world whose primary business is to tear things and people down rather than build them up. And that's what the Pharisees did. And it was a clear symptom that something was not right. Right there. Now let's say, for example, because I came from, the, well, you know, Boyd, I came from the Pentecostal Church, which is um, an expression of the holiness movement. And there's certain rules and regulations within that denomination. Now let's say that you have decided that alcohol is something that you want to avoid. You know that for you, drinking it would be unwise. Maybe there's a generational issue. But you know for you it's not the right thing to do, and so that's fine. And I would commend that because you want to guard your own heart. You can't find it in Scripture because it, does, it only says that drunkenness is wrong. So, but for yourself, you know, it's just not the right thing. But if you start feeling judgmental towards other people who have a social drink, and you think that somehow they're less godly than you because they're doing that, you have just discovered that you are a pharisaical fault finder. You are measuring them against your own personal decisions and behaviors. See how subtle it is? Now, if someone can't go 24 hours without gambling, then we would say they're addicted to gambling. If a person can't go 24 hours without smoking, we would say they're addicted to nicotine. No one argues this. But what if a person can't go 24 hours without fault finding? Are they addicted to being critical? It's not consistent with a heart filled with God. But there's more here, we learn in this passage. These people were stuck on the traditions of men. In Matthew 15, these rule keepers complain that Jesus ignored the traditions. Notice the words, the traditions of the elders. And these are Jesus' words, red letters, you hypocrites. Ouch. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely, are merely human rules. So what we have here now is another symptom of when religion or faith goes wrong. Jesus indicates that our hearts are far from him when we emphasize human traditions over the commandments of God. So, in my lifetime, here's a few of these examples that I've faced. I remember as a young believer uh, entering the church and was absolutely speechless when I saw someone, an elder in the church, turn away a young person because they wore jeans. 
Hmm. I've worn jeans ever since. <laughs> wow. I've seen people lose their sanctification arguing over whether contemporary songs should be sung in a church or if, whether it should be just hymns, whether there should be organ or piano. I've seen teens punished by their Christian parents for listening to rock music, even if it's Christian rock music. I've seen arguments and church splits over communion being wine or juice. <laughs> um, I, we know of churches that have regulations about weekly confession, praying to Mary. Um, there's different groups that insist on denominational na names. But here's the deal, according to Jesus, if it's not in the Bible, if it's not a commandment of God, and you are teaching it as a rule of life, you have turned the faith inside out, and you miss the point of what it means to be a God lover. Wow. Altogether, fault finders, as it relates to maintaining the traditions of men, is an indication, according to Jesus here, of a heart it's not sad, right? Hypocrites, he calls them. It's strong. Ron Jones, is Ron here or is he downstairs? He's downstairs. He's downstairs. How many of you baseball fans here? I know Ron is. A couple here. So do you know the name Robinson Cano? Cano? Yeah. So he, was, he played for the New York Yankees. He was an all-star second baseman. But he left the Yankees and he went to play for the Seattle Mariners because they offered him in 2013 uh, $214 million. Okay, so we understand why he went to Seattle. It was of great anticipation when, having left the New York Yankees and gone to Seattle, when he was going to come back to New York Yankee Stadium and play against them. And so, of course, he was expecting some booze and some things like that because the New York Yankee fans, they considered his leaving a disloyalty. But what Jimmy Fallon did is he made a cardboard cutout of him and took it to the main street so that people in New York could practice booing. <coughs> so he had the, new, the cutout there and so people would come up to him and, and they'd start booing, go back to Seattle, we don't want anything, if you're a rotten, disloyal, blah, blah, blah. They go. But what they didn't know is Robinson Cano was behind the cardboard cutout. <laughs> and after they had carried on for a little while, he would step out to see them. And suddenly they would go, go back to where you come. Oh, it's so nice to see you again. Welcome to New York City. We've been missing you. Isn't it interesting how people will talk one way when you're not present and handle themselves differently when you're suddenly there? Hypocrites. Hmm. This is a real important one. We're going to talk about being offended. Have any, have any of you, don't acknowledge this, ever been offended? Jesus discusses with them a real example of hypocrisy. We don't have time to unpack it here because sermons are too short. That would be something for Bible study. But the bottom line is, is that the, the Pharisees didn't like what Jesus said. And the disciples come back to Jesus in Matthew 15, 12, and he said, they say to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you say these things? They were offended. Someone ever offended you? Said something to you? Huh, you didn't like it? Something did something to you? Or somebody neglected to say hello to you? Or neglected to, to remember your birthday or something like that? You were offended. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Pharisees, they're just so offended by what you just said. Being offended is a sign that your own heart isn't right with God. You see, pride is the original sin. And psychologists call it the narcissistic injury. You cannot be offended unless you are <coughs> proud. There's a story of a frog. He used to see the swans fly south every year and wished he could fly. So he had an idea. And he approached the swans and said, Look, if you both take the opposite ends of a stick and I bite onto the stick in the middle, 
you can take me south with you. So they agreed to this and they were flying along and it was working wonderful until a South Carolinian farmer looked up and went, I can't believe this. Whose idea was that? The frog couldn't resist the answer. <laughs> when you're offended, even though someone might have said something or done something or neglected something, there's another issue. It's what's going on inside you. And it's an indication of pride. And your own heart isn't tuned up the way it should be. Duke Ellington, a jazz musician, was asked how he felt about not being able as a black man to stay in the guest rooms of hotels where he and his, his band would perform. And that was all because of segregation. He answered, I took the energy it takes to pout and I wrote some blues instead. <laughs> So this whole discourse between Jesus and the Pharisees and the disciples coming and saying, oh, they're all offended. Jesus explains to them that it's not outward behaviors that affect our hearts, but what's in our hearts affect our choices and behaviors. Why wasn't there apple juice or Dr. Pepper or Pepsi on the towel? Because it was water in the glass. It's what's in our hearts that determines how we live our lives. Mark 7, verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about uh, his teaching. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all things <coughs> clean. But he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it's from within, out of a person's heart that all these evil thoughts come. Now, in his book entitled Unchristian, David, Kin David Kinnaman highlights a number of statistics that he, he gathered together in 2002. And it was about discovering how people outside the church community viewed those inside. And the statistics were that nearly 9 out of 10 young outsiders, young people, 87% said that the term judgmental Accurately, accurately describe present-day Christians. So most people out there perceive us as being judgmental. Of the non-Christian survey, 84% said they personally know at least one committed Christian, and yet only 15% of them thought that their lifestyles matched what they said they believed. See, friends, we're not called to be religious. We are called to be in relationship with God. We're called to be in a vibrant, life-giving relationship with Jesus. And the mantra of our faith community here is that we are to be kind to everyone we meet because everyone we meet is fighting a hard battle. And so the takeaway this morning from the red letters is this. No fault finding. It's like listening to bagpipe music. How many of you do that? I, I, I never know whether they're in tune or not, but that's another issue. <laughs> listening to bagpipe, if you listen closely, it's, it, there's a drone. But you have to put that out of your head and listen to the music that's laid on top of it. Don't listen to the drone. Don't look for the drone in people's life, but look to the music that's coming from it. Don't be looking for people to be doing bad, look for them to be doing good. It also means we do not teach the traditions of men as something essential. If somebody wants to abide by the traditions of men, God bless them, maybe they're doing that for a reason that's personal to them. But it's not essential and you can't superimpose it onto others. And it also means that we need to grow to a place where we do not take personal offense for the things people say or do or don't do. Ultimately, it means Letting God fill our hearts with Himself so that He is so much within us that what comes out is a blessing. And others will know that we are with Christ. Amen? These are the red letters of our Lord and Savior. Amen.